my interest really peaked in um, learning, reading, talking to people about Earth Day was really from Frank Blair's report. It was on the Tay Show. And it kind of blew me away that he, he, this is what he went on to say. Earth Day demonstrations began in practically every city and town in the United States this morning, the first massive nationwide protest against the pollution of the environment. The outcry took innumerable forms. Some students went to school wearing gas masks. The automobile was banned in parts of some cities, including New York. Miami planned a dead orange parade. Sky riding planes were ordered out to inscribe the word air over Los Angeles. In Jamestown, New York, the Kiwanis Club arranged to dump 20 tons of sand in a downtown area to show just how much dirt falls in one square mile of the city during just 30 days of maximum air pollution. I know that I was a signer of the original Earth Day proclamation, but I thought, well, this is a good idea, and uh, we ought to proclaim Earth Day. I thought about it just for the city of Jamestown. As you know, it became international. In fact, Wu Thant, the, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, was one of the original signers of that proclamation. I think Jamestown was probably singled out as a small city that, that had a pretty good record on environmental kinds of uh, 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 responsibilities. We thought that it was important that young people be acquainted with uh, the need to clean up and uh, uh, provide better policies with regard to uh, air, water, uh, pollution. When I, I recall very clearly we lived on Forest Avenue, and uh, the Board of Public Utilities electric plant would give off smoke, and and really you couldn't hang your wash out. Uh, but that was considered normal. I remember the problems on, like on the north side of Jamestown. The, the, the snow was much darker than it was on the west side of Jamestown uh, as a kid, and uh, mm -hmm. that kind of thing you would hear at those kind of conversations. And the women, you know, were, as the mayor mentioned about putting out their laundry, they couldn't do that, and uh, the kids would be out playing on the porch or playing in the lawn, and their clothes would be get a little darker than they would normally. And uh, people claimed that was a result of some of the smoke and pollution in the air. We we did, uh, while I was mayor, in that six-year period, we did uh, clean up the emissions quite a bit. Jamestown had, had, by acreage, one of the largest park systems in New York State for, for many years, and still it's almost in the leading category. And uh, they, they had a good tree program, a wonderful city forest, a great tree canopy in Jamestown. We look at the beauty of West 3rd Street with those trees, but every other street in town just had beautiful canopies of trees. I remember being there, I remember the mayor's encouragement that I'd be there, and the, the Parks and Recreation and the Department of Public Works uh, be supportive and take an interest in the program. And uh, I, I was overwhelmed to see that much piled on the street <laughs> that was, was gathered in our community. And one of the thoughts is, oh, am I going to have to pick that up after this is over? <laughs> <laughs> and with the Earth Day program, I could feel then and feel now even how important it was to Jamestown, whether it started on the pile of that dirt there on Cherry Street or whether it started in other mines and other parts of the country. It was so important to Jamestown. They got people talking about it. The Qantas Club got interested in it. All the service clubs got interested in it. It was a conversation in schools. It was a conversation in, in playgrounds. And people began to look and wonder what they were doing, what they were throwing. When I re retired, I decided I'd do something totally different and, and walk sort of down a path of another interest of mine, and that was the environment. So I started reading E.O. E. Wilson, the entomologist, and I found his work with insects was really fascinating. And one of the connections that he made is there are very few animals that collaborate and cooperate for survival. You two were speaking, it was like there was this collaboration and cooperation, and there wasn't a big difference between a Democrat 
and a Republican. And it was self-evident what was happening in terms of the environment, the water, the air, the soil. And everyone got together and think about it, Earth Day, and then I think it was only one single year until that Clean Water and Clean Soil Act were passed. In today's terms, politically, you're probably talking 10 years. But you can't stand in front of a group like this without feeling the power which can flow from it. And so what we must do is to make every day Earth Day. And they said that Earth Day really did provide an impetus so that uh, there was a widespread recognition in the Congress at the time, necessity of uh, cleaning up air and water. I do feel, uh, I just hope there's a continued education, a continual uh, uh, talking about the environment, a continue talking about the appreciation of the trees, appreciating of the flowers and the grasses and all the wonderful things we have. Let's just not take them for granted. It, it could be possibility that there may, some generation may wake up a day where there'll not be a tree in Jamestown. Uh, there may not be grass in Jamestown. There may not be air that you can't breathe only unless you breathe it through a mask. And we've been able to do that, so uh, let's protect that. And the thing that always spins in my mind when I look at a tree, I look at the leaves, I look at the grass on all the athletic fields, I look at the flowers, I realize that that tree there, it was a de development from a single first seed. Where did that seed come from that put that tree there? Where did that seed come from that put that blade of grass in Bergman Park or at the stadium? Uh, where does that seed come from that put the first dandelion that grows in my backyard? And uh, I have a respect and an understanding for that and appreciation. And just hope that cycle does not end. Be it therefore resolved that each signer of the People Proclamation will seek to help charge man's terrible course toward catastrophe by searching for activities and projects which in the best judgment of the individual signer will peacefully end the scourge of war, provide an opportunity for children of the disinherited poor to obtain their rightful inheritance, inheritance on earth uh, and redirect energies of industry and society from progress through products to process through harmony with earth, Earth's natural systems and improving the quality of life. On, on this day, we'll join at 1900 Universal Time in a global Earth Hour, a silent hour for peace. I'm interested in the overall things, how politics works and how ecology works and how people either do collaborate and cooperate or don't collaborate and cooperate. So in this time and age, I think we really need to work together to bring understanding. I wanted to start something new besides working on my own work, artwork, and curating. When I was out of undergraduate school, I remember going to the library for a week and looking at what I wanted to do. And one of the things I did fairly well in science, so I was looking into conservation and then also going back to art school. And I ended up going to art school, but when I first started working on my master's degree, Love Canal happened in 1978. So it drew me into those ideas, and I ended up working on a documentary project there. And that ended up in some significant art shows uh, at the Castellani Art Museum and a couple other venues. So that kind of rekindled my interest in the environment. But growing up in this area, so many people uh, talk about going to Allegheny State Park, Presque Isle. It was back when children were free-range children. <laughs> um, you would hop on your bike and you would be gone for eight hours and come back with a suntan and really hungry, running into the dinner table. And it was just different times, but I think children were much more connected uh, to the environment and much more aware of the surroundings. Um, and today, Becky Nystrom, who is one of our panelists, I'm going to skip around a little bit, she mentioned that today it's even more important to try to engage in environmental issues because the children are on their iPads, they're watching television, they're playing video games. Not that they're horrible 
as devices, but if you're doing it all the time and you're not connecting to the real world, then we, when, then we have a problem. So anyway, Luke and I started talking about the environment and how it's connected biblically and um, just responsibilities each of us have to try to change society and inform voters to make better decisions. So then we decided to collaborate and cooperate. We're working with the Autobahn, obviously working with the Jackson Center. They put together really some awesome programs. We're working with RTPI. <coughs> we worked with the James Prendergast Library on an eco-read. It was actually our kickoff event. Have you heard of uh, Sherry Sam Mason? Yes. Um, she came in and spoke, um, and she was marvelous. And she talked about Silent Spring and connected it to her own work. Um, so we thought it was important because Rachel Carson really is sort of the uh, mother of the modern environmental mo movement, sort of a prophet of what was coming, to present Silent Spring, which was her final piece, but then to also um, have a panel discussion about under sea wind. And we had Jonathan Townsend came in. He's a bat biologist. And then Becky Nystrom, um, she taught at Jamestown Community College for 30, 35 <coughs> years, taught four or five courses, traveled to Costa Rica. So she had input on undersea wind. And then we had Lee John, who's a local uh, radio announcer, come in. And he pretended in one reading that he was a pirate, and the other reading that he was like um, an educated person who had a desk job and never did any physical labor, and he was talking about the fishermen bringing in the nets and what that was all about. So it was an appreciation of how man connects to nature and the physical aspects of that. And then the third read was as an older man watching the gulls uh, heading on their Arctic trip and then coming back and how the older gulls were having a hard time keeping up with the flight. So he was perceiving that, uh, the young gulls coming back, the older ones, and looking at the generational differences and kind of thinking of his own life and where he was at that time. So um, we were very excited. We drew 100 people for the Eco Read at the Prentagast Library. Um, when we first introduced it, we shared Sam Mason. And for the panel discussion, I think we had about 50. And actually, both of them ended up setting uh, records for attendance for those types of events. And Chautauqua Region Community Foundation, we have to give them a plug. Um, they purchased 50 books of Under the Sea Wind and also helped us with some advertising. But anyway, I want to give a, a little bit of a plug for the Audubon, skip around here. Um, if you go to our website or the Audubon's website, um, we have events listed for different organizations. And they've had a series of children's events in the winter to draw them in and have, have books and they're going to be out going out and cleaning up on Earth Day. But they're also doing a seeds and soil, planting your garden. And they're going to do a whole series with a gardener that's been working for 35 years in Warren. It's going to start at the Audubon and then they're actually going to go to their gardens as they nurture them. And in the end, when they harvest, they're going to have a meal out of the garden. So if you'd like to see it kind of from the beginning, preparing the soil, planting the seeds, and the harvest at the end, it's, I think it's going to be really an awesome program. And RTPI um, also has events that are coming up you can check online. And our final event that we're having is on April 22nd. And Percussion Group Cincinnati, have any of you ever heard that group by any chance? Um, they're, they're really an awesome group. They're three guys. They did, performed and toured with John Cage. And they're going to do a special Earth Day workshop at 1 o'clock on Saturday, April 22nd. It's open to the public. And then in the evening, we're going to have what I call an art happening from what we did at the Weeks Gallery. Luke is going to start out with um, just an Earth ceremony and we're going to have candle lighting and earth wishes go with that. There's also going to be an optional like 10 to 15 minutes of either prayer or meditation for Earth Day. And then um, we're gonna move, Bill Ward is going to have guitar music and we're going to have refreshments. 
And then we're going to also include um, Sarah uh, Rosenthal from Warren. She's a bat photographer and bird photographer. She's going to show her photographs. And then Marilyn Martin also photographs leaves. They're going to be part of it. And then at 7.30, Percussion Group Cincinnati is going to perform. And again, it's an Earth Day concert, and they're going to play global um, instruments and indigenous instruments. And um, basically, there are um, some numbers that they've actually created that are nature sounds, as well as some pieces that were created beforehand. So um, there's really quite a bit still to come up with all of that. And again, Greg's programs are awesome. In between, we had a couple events. Um, Luke Fodor presented um, Be Fruitful and Multiply. Did God really propose human do domination of creation? So we actually looked at biblical references and looked at two different versions from the Bible and how you can interpret them in different ways. One was about dominion over, and the other one was about the harmonious relationship. So you look in one book and there's a version that's shorter, in another book they really put it in context in terms of how it's important to live off nature, but at the same time to feed it and nurture the farms. Certainly that's important. And he also connected up to Celtic um, traditions in another lecture. And then Tuan came, uh, Tuan Lenders, Lenders from RTPI, and he talked about Peterson and Jamestown being sort of the Eden when he grew up in terms of the environment was here. And I, I know that Jackson's, Craig Hill's presentation is going to be about how much he loved the natural surrounds of Chautauqua County and, and northern Pennsylvania, northwest Pennsylvania as well, where he grew up. So 